Well, welcome to Sunday School on the Go from the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee as we continue our study of the prophetic message of Isaiah. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in Al Harris's Pairs and Spares class, and I have the privilege of guiding you through our study of the longest book of prophecy in our Old Testaments and the one most quoted in the New, with messages that are as relevant to our time as they were when Isaiah first recorded them for us. As we open the Word of God on this second Sunday in October to the 31st chapter of Isaiah's prophetic message, Isaiah chapter 31, we find that Isaiah's message to the people of Judah, like the chapter before, is intended to convince them of the danger of an alliance with Egypt against the Assyrians, and that they should place their trust wholly in God and not in man. In this chapter, Isaiah pronounces a woe on those who would seek help from Egypt and warns his hearers of God's judgment if they were to do so. He tells them that completely without Egypt's aid, God would protect the city of Jerusalem and calls them to place their trust and hope in Him alone who can rescue them because it is God who will destroy the Assyrians. Once again, all they need to do is trust and wait upon the Lord. The date is somewhere between 705 and 702 B.C. Isaiah is by now an old man and has been proclaiming the word of the Lord for around 35 years. In Isaiah chapter 36, we read that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, attacked all but one of the fortified cities in Judah and captured them. And now he was marching against the last stronghold, Jerusalem itself. Hezekiah has been the king for 14 years at this point. From what we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, Hezekiah was now 25, year, was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 29 years. He's been a good king for the most part, and pretty much the exact opposite of his father Ahaz. In the first month of his reign, he began the process of cleansing and reconstructing the temple. The author of 2 Kings chapter 18 writes, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. When Hezekiah had been king for only four years, Sennacherib began his assault against Samaria. And two years later, Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, fell. And all the members of the ten northern tribes were carried off and dispersed throughout the lands of the Assyrians, never to return to their homeland ever again. The writer of 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 says, All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Ironically, it had been the Egyptians that the people of the northern kingdom had appealed to to rescue them from the Assyrians. But when Sennacherib found out about their treachery, he had Hoshea, the king, arrested, and Sennacherib continued on with his conquest of Israel. Fast forward now 10 years, to the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign. Sennacherib, still king of the Assyrians, has moved south from Israel to Judah and has attacked all the fortified cities of Judah. Here's what the writer of 2 Kings chapter 18 says, beginning in verse 14. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. The king of Assyria extracted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold with which he had covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord 
and gave it to the king of Assyria. Now, with all his nation's treasuries emptied, Hezekiah knows he has nothing left to offer Sennacherib. He needed help. So what did he do? He reached out to the closest possible ally, Egypt. This is one of those points in histories when you, when you have to sit back and wonder, what in the world was he thinking? Didn't he learn anything from what had happened just 10 years earlier to his fellow Jews to the north? So as Isaiah proclaims this word of the Lord in chapter 31, beginning in the first verse, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on, on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and does not retract his words but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh, and not spirit. So the Lord will stretch out his hand, and he who helps will stumble, and he who helped will fall, and all of them will come to an end together. For thus saith the Lord to me, as a lion or the young lion growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds is called out, and he will not be terrified at their voice, nor disturbed at their noise, so will the Lord of hosts come down to wage more war on Mount Zion and on its hill. Isaiah first pronounces a woe on those who look to Egypt for help. We've heard Isaiah begin a new message with the word woe several times already in his prophecy. The word is a momentous, fateful call to stop and reflect on weighty decisions that are about to be made. And Isaiah uses it to indicate the certainty of calamity and judgment that could be unleashed at any moment. But, you could almost imagine Hezekiah's army general saying, look, look at the resources Egypt has, horses and chariots and horsemen. And we, we've sent out some excellent recon teams, and, and their detailed force analysis confirms that the Egyptians are far better equipped, trained, resourced, and capable than the armies of the Assyrians. Sure, there may still be some bad blood between us and the Egyptians, but, but that was a long time ago. Now, they're our best bet for protection against Sennacherib and all his forces. Somehow, whether this was how the conversation went or not, Hezekiah seemed to think appealing to the Egyptians was their best or maybe their only option. But the prophet of God says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. This is actually the fourth warning he has given to Hezekiah and his advisors since chapter 27. There are at least two reasons why Isaiah considered this such a serious offense. The first is that it's impossible for us to place our full confidence in people or anything else and God at the same time. Our eyes are withdrawn from him as soon as we look to something else. The second reason is that God had expressly forbidden them to enter into any alliance with the Egyptians in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, where Moses, Moses said, The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. When Isaiah speaks of those who go down to Egypt, he's probably referring to the fact that emissaries from Judah had already made several trips there to work out some kind of an agreement for support. They've invested a lot of time and effort currying Egypt's favor, confirming its military might, and negotiating an alliance. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Isaiah wants them to know that there's another source of help, one that they've not even considered. So in verse 2, Isaiah said, Yet he also is wise. Hezekiah, your, your advisors are pretty smart. Your military brass has a lot of brain power. Your counselors are clever. But God is wise too, you know. There's 
a bit of pointed irony in Isaiah's words, as if to say, God is wise, but you are fools. And so he's dead serious. Of all the wisdom you've collected to advise you in this decision, you've left out God himself. And that, my brothers, is a huge mistake. Not only is God wise, he will also bring disaster in line with his wisdom. He sees the sins of the people, and in order to turn them back to him through repentance, he chastises them. Speaking to the people of Israel, the prophet Amos asks in Amos chapter 3, verse 6, When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? It seems they had forgotten that God is not just concerned about their activities in the temple, but that he's concerned about every aspect of their lives, political, military, financial, relational, social. God was the God of every part of their lives, and he's the God of every part of our lives as well. He also is wise when it comes to our finances, our families, and our futures, our employment, our entertainment, and our retirement, and everything else in between. As one commentator suggests, they limited God to the ceremonies and exceptional occasions of life, when they looked for His glory or miraculous assistance, but they never thought that in their ordinary ways He had any interest or design. The forgetfulness against which Isaiah directs this shaft of satire is the besetting sin of very religious people, of very successful people, and of very clever people. It's a temptation of ordinary Christian church-going people like ourselves, with a religion so full of marvelous mercies and so blessed with regular opportunities of worship, to thank God only in connection with these, and practically to ignore that along the great, far greater stretches of life, He has any interest or purpose regarding us. Formerly religious people treat God as if He were simply a constitutional sovereign, to step in at emergencies and for the rest to play a nominal and ceremonial part in the conduct of their lives. Ignoring the divine wisdom and ceaseless providence of God and couching their hearts upon easy views of His benevolence, they have no other thought of Him than as a philanthropic magician whose power is reserved to extricate men when they have got past helping themselves. The Bible and human experience, though, make it clear that God has one way of responding to those who ignore His wisdom. God meets them with their own weapons. He outmatches them using their own schemes. In the 18th Psalm we read, To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless you show yourself blameless. To the pure you show yourself pure. But to the crooked you show yourself shrewd. The rich fool that Jesus speaks about in Luke chapter 12 congratulates himself that his soul is his own. But God says, this very night your life will be demanded of you. And of course, the greatest reversal of fate in all of history occurred in a borrowed tomb when the Son of God, who had been declared dead by humans and celebrated by Satan as dead, rose from the dead, never to die again. Applied to the current situation, Isaiah says, This very God, who is also wise, who brings disaster, and who does not go back on His word, will rise up against that wicked nation, against those who help evildoers. Judah is that wicked nation, because they have not sought God's wisdom or help, and they violated God's express prohibition of seeking help from Egypt. And if Egypt were to try to help Judah, Egypt itself would become an object of God's wrath. Then in verse 3, Isaiah offers his own comparison of the relative strength of the resources available to them. He compares God and the Egyptians. The Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. The Egyptians, he says, are nothing more than people. They have no other power than that of other people. Why would Hezekiah and his advisors ever stoop to compare all of Egypt's armed forces with the hosts of heaven? Whatever strength the Egyptians had, had been granted to them by God. In Psalm 146, verse 3, we read, Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. Jeremiah 
takes us another step when he records the words of the Lord in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. And what about the horses that provided such formidable support for the Egyptian army? Their horses are flesh and not spirit. We might well marvel at the strength and speed of a horse, but can we really make any comparison between a horse and God? Underlying Isaiah's critique of the Egyptians and the choice Ezekiah and his advisors are pursuing is that the present crisis has not been brought about by the conflict of mere earthly forces. There is a spiritual battle being waged here. We should never forget that we are not just flesh and bone creatures. We are spiritual beings created in the image and likeness of God to live in fellowship with Him. And Satan and all his forces are waging a relentless battle in the battle in the spiritual realm to do everything they can to take away from God's glory and turn us against him. Such was the situation here in Isaiah's day. And we would do well to heed Isaiah's words as well as Paul's word to the Ephesians in chapter 6 about spiritual warfare. Neither man nor horse is to be relied upon because all God needs to do is stretch out His hand. And when that happens, both Egypt, who is called to help, and Judah, who is asked for the help, will be laid low. Isaiah knows it's not enough for the people of Judah to remember how wise God is. They also need to know how formidable and supremely powerful He can show Himself to be. So he adds two very pertinent comparisons in verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, we find the picture of a mighty lion. As a lion growls, a great lion over its prey, and though a whole band of shepherds is called together against it, it is not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So the Lord Almighty will come down to do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Well, the lion, of course, is an extremely powerful animal bent on capturing and killing its prey. And Far greater than any lion, God is both totally willing and able to destroy those arrayed against Him or protect those in His care. When a lion has stolen a lamb from the flock, all the shepherds are called out to help and save it. But the lion is not alarmed by their shouts and doesn't respond to all their noise. He won't let them deprive Him of His prey. So commentators find two ways to understand this. The first is that no one can stand against God when He moves against anyone or anything. The second is that those whom He holds in His hand are securely defended and protected. And both are equally true. So it's both a warning against Judah and Egypt as they pursue their alliance against Assyria, as well as a message of great comfort to those who trust God's wisdom and His promises. Through the unyielding persistence of God's divine grace, He will never let go of those He has made His own and redeemed from their sin. Although we're surrounded by all sorts of enemies, some set on destroying us, particularly Satan and all his forces, we are infinitely protected. But like Aslan of the Chronicles of Narnia, God is not a tame lion. If we were to step outside of His will, we could find ourselves face to face with His displeasure and His judgment. The second illustration from nature clearly shows God intended to protect Jerusalem. Like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and will rescue it. Just as birds defend their young by hovering over them, securing them under their wings, and swooping after anything that might endanger them, God will shield Jerusalem from all its foes. Alexander McLaren, the 19th century Baptist pastor I'm fond of quoting, writes, Jerusalem was a nest on which for long centuries that infinite divine love had brooded. It was but a poor brood that had been hatched out, but... Yet, as birds flying, he had watched over the city. Can you not almost see the mother bird 
made bold by, by maternal love, swooping down upon the intruder that sought to rob the nest and spreading her broad pinion over the callow fledglings that lie below. That is what God does with us. As I said, it is a poor brood that is hatched out. That does not matter. Still, the love bends down and helps. Nobody but a prophet could have ventured on such a metaphor as that, and nobody but Jesus Christ would have ventured to mend it and say, as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings when there are hawks in the sky. So he, in all the past ages, was the one that, as birds flying, descended on his people and defended them and would have gathered them under his wings, only they would not. There's an interesting word that appears here in verse 5 that could be easily missed and, and is by a few translators. In the last line of the verse, we read, He will pass over it and will rescue it. This word for pass over is the very word that was used in Exodus chapter 12, where the Lord is describing the procedures the Israelites were to follow in preparation for the last of the ten plagues to fall upon Egypt, the death of the firstborn. Each family was to take a one-year-old lamb without defect and take care of it until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel would slaughter their lambs at dusk. Then they were to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they would then eat the lambs. They were even given instructions on how to eat it. Then the Lord said, On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This annual commemoration came to be called the Passover because God's angel of death passed over the houses that had been prepared with the blood of the Lamb. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 31, God says He will again pass over His people and spare them from the destruction that He will bring to others. For us on this side of the cross, we know that Jesus is our Passover Lamb who gave His blood for the remission of our sin. But what are these pictures of a lion and a mother bird had to say to the people of Isaiah's day and to us today, they remind us that God gives those who are truly His children an absolute promise to protect them from every evil and sustain them in every conflict. And we can be sure that this promise doesn't apply to the things of the spiritual world alone, but again, to every aspect of our lives. One thing we need to remember, though, is that our perspective of what is evil and what is good is limited to our own understanding. We don't always see things as God sees them. So sometimes the things we think are evil are actually the things God is using to shape us and mold us into the image of Christ. As Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 11 and 12, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent His rebuke because the Lord disciplines those He loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Once again, Alexander McLaren adds, Of course, I do not need to remind you that this hovering protector, this strong shield, this destroying angel that passes by our houses if the blood is on the threshold does not guarantee us any exemption from the common ills that flesh is heir to. We all know that well enough. But what does it guarantee? It guarantees that all the poison shall be wiped off the arrow, that all the evil shall be taken out of the evil, that it will change its character, that if we observe the conditions, the sharpest sorrow will come to us with this written on it by the Father's hand, with my love to my child. That pain will be discipline, and discipline will be blessed. Ah, dear friends, I'm sure there are many of us that can set to our seals that God is true in this matter and that we have found that His rod does blossom and that our sorest sorrows have been our greatest mercies, drawing us nearer to Him, defending He will deliver and passing over He will preserve. 
But Isaiah's promise is conditional. If the people of Judah would not, and if people today will not, turn to the Lord, they and we will see him as a roaring lion that nothing and no one can turn away. And that's why Isaiah makes this urgent appeal in verses 6 and 7. Return to him from whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. For in that day every man will cast away his silver idols and his gold idols, which your sinful hands have made for you as a sin. Isaiah uses some brutally blunt words here to describe the condition of the people of Judah. They have deeply defected from or deeply revolted from the Lord. Isaiah does not by any means lessen the guilt of the people, nor should he and neither should we. In a few words, he pictures the desperation of their condition. It was a terrifying, eternally significant confrontation with the fact that their sin had eternal consequences. Their sin was an infinite sin because it was committed by finite people against an infinite God. And the only way the punishment for an infinite sin could be paid for was that punishment to last for an infinite amount of time for all eternity. It's not until they and until we understand the immensity of the consequences of our sin would they and will we take it seriously and repent of it. But as deep as their, as their rejection of the Lord had been, God still invites them to return and experience His love, His forgiveness, and His restoration. If they repent, if they reject their sin and rebellion as they had once rejected God, He will still pardon them and restore them once again. Isaiah declares that, Although by their wickedness they are slipping fast into the, to the depths of Sheol and the judgment that awaits and gaining speed along the way, as it were, God is ready to forgive. It's not in vain that He invites us to repent and offers a full pardon for our sins. Whenever God calls people to repent, He's always holding out His full forgiveness, as He does in this passage and throughout the Word of God. We do well to remember, though, what Paul reminds us in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6 and verse 2, in part quoting from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. When God calls, that moment is a moment to respond. In verse 6, Isaiah addresses them as the children of Israel. In calling them by this name, he doesn't intend to show them respect, but instead reprimands them for their ingratitude because they were rebellious, degenerate children who had inexcusably departed from the faith and the obedience of their fathers. Still, the Lord has not forgotten the covenant that he made with their fathers in spite of the fact that they had forsaken him and their rebellion. So he still acknowledges them as the children of Israel and will fulfill all that He promised to Abraham and His descendants if they would return to Him with all their hearts. Here's a preview of the word from the Lord we'll hear again in chapter 65 and verse 2. All day long, the Lord says, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face. Yet, he continues to hold out His hands to them and to us. As the children of Israel genuinely repent and return to the Lord, two things will happen. First, they will give evidence of their repentance. And professed repentance that does not follow with practical evidence of that repentance always leaves the authenticity of the repentance in doubt. James and Paul in the New Testament both agree that genuine faith results in genuine evidence of that faith. It's not the works that produce the faith, but it's always works of righteousness that naturally flow from God's work of righteousness in the life of an authentic believer. In this case, the evidence takes the form of casting away the silver and gold idols that they had made with their very own hands. 
The great 16th century reformer, John Calvin, notes that Isaiah calls them idols of silver and gold rather than idols of wood and stone because they refer to those things, Calvin says, that we hold to be the most precious and beloved of those things that we place above God. Giving up things of wood and stone would pale in comparison to giving up things made from the most precious metals. He writes, In this matter we must listen to none of the excuses which we frequently hear from the lips of hypocrites who cannot absolutely renounce idolatry. What could I do, they say? How could I live? I am aware that this revenue, this gold, is detestable in the sight of God because it arises from idolatry, but in some way or other my life must be supported. Away with such fooleries, say I, for where the conversion of the heart is real, that which cannot be retained without insulting or dishonoring God is instantly thrown away. Other commentators understand this to be literal idols made from silver and gold. And in several places in this book, Isaiah has already commanded his hearers to rid themselves of the false gods that they have made for themselves. Following the lead of Ahaz and other ungodly kings that had ruled over Judah, the people had made for themselves images to worship, just like the images made by the nations surrounding them. When it appeared to them that God was incapable or unwilling to come to their rescue, they assumed that the gods of their enemies were stronger and thus more worthy of their worship. So they made for themselves idols like those of their enemies. What they continued to forget was that God allowed them to experience suffering, not because he was weak, but because he was using other people and other nations to discipline them, to chastise them for their sin and disobedience. What they just couldn't figure out was how God could use other godless nations to be the executioners of his judgment. Habakkuk, the prophet, marveled at the same thing, but God made it clear to Habakkuk's hearers and Isaiah's hearers that he can use any means he wishes to bring about his will. From Isaiah's perspective, it was the worship of silver and gold idols that was a huge stumbling block to their deliverance. And if they repented of their adulterous worship, the clearest evidence of that would be to get rid of these idols. As one commentator notes, hence he informs us that our obstinacy is the reason why the Lord adds evil to evil and doubles his strokes and pursues us more and more for we continue to supply fresh materials to inflame his vengeance against us more and more. If therefore we wish that God's chastisements should be less severe, if we wish that the enemies should fall to the ground and perish, let us endeavor to be reconciled to him by repentance, for he will speedily put an end to the chastisement and will take away the enemy's strength and power to injure us. The second thing that would happen as the children of Israel respond to God's gracious call to genuine repentance is that they would be delivered from their enemies, as we read in verses 8 and 9. And the Assyrian shall fall by a sword, not of man, and a sword, not of man, shall devour him, and he shall flee from the sword, and his young man shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is, on, is, is in Zion, and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Throughout the word of God, the sword is used to describe an instrument of punishment. So it will be with Assyria, as God himself rains destruction on the nation of Assyria, as he wields a sword himself, not with the help of any human resource. The reference to destruction is repeated twice for emphasis. God will cause the Assyrians to fall, and God will destroy the Assyrian army. Isaiah adds that he, meaning Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, will escape. He also says that the young man shall be put to forced labor. Now the word we have translated as forced labor usually refers to paying tribute as a defeated nation would pay a tax to the conquering army. The root of the word may mean to melt away, as if to describe the melting away of the people and the resources as they have to pay this burdensome tribute. Here in verse 8, 
The root meaning may be more descriptive of the melting fear that would grip the young Assyrian soldiers in their retreat from the hand of the Lord. Not only will the Assyrian army be vanquished, the king escape, and the young men melt in fear, the entire army will panic and make a hasty retreat. His rock shall pass away in terror gives us the great contrast between the security the Assyrians thought they had, the strength and security of a rock, with the actual situation. They fled in absolute terror. It may have been that the Assyrians had assembled fallback positions, defensive battlements that they could retreat to if the battle turned against them. But in that day, the safety that they imagined that they could have found there has evaporated in light of the overwhelming force that they will encounter as God wages war against them himself. The princes or the officers will even be afraid of the battle flag, the ensign that stands against them. Just the simplest sign of opposition will send them scurrying away. In our lesson for next week, we'll see how this defeat of the Assyrian army happened exactly as Isaiah said it would. Well, who has pronounced this judgment on Assyria and told the nation of not to make an alliance with Egypt? It is the Lord whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. God is trustworthy and true, and he will surely defend the place where he is worshipped. And that, of course, was in Jerusalem. The reference to the fire and the furnace may be to the two aspects of the Lord's presence in Jerusalem, a fire providing light to his chosen people and a fire of destruction to his enemies. His fire is in Zion. In the temple, there was an altar, and one of the responsibilities of the priests was to keep the fire on the altar continually burning, as we read from Leviticus chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13. Far greater than this is the love that burns in the very heart of God for His people. God is passionately devoted to His people, and the Bible and Jesus Himself speak of the boundless love God has for you and for me. With that in mind... Why would Isaiah and the people of Judah ever seek help from Egypt? Or why would we fail to trust in God who loved us so much that he sent his son to demonstrate his love for us and for those around us? And his furnace is in Jerusalem. The word for furnace refers to a baking oven where a large fire was built to heat the inside of the oven, then the wood removed to bake the bread. Some see this as suggesting that God had made his home in Jerusalem with the oven as representative of the center of the cooking operations in a home, and God would certainly defend his home from any and all danger. But we also read that God is a consuming fire in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 3. For those who would oppose him, whether it be Assyrian aggressors or those who chose to seek help from Egypt, they find him to be a consuming fire of a blast furnace that burns all the chaff and impurities and yet purifies those he chooses to save through the flames. A growling lion, a protective mother bird, an unseen power, a heart of love that burns for his people, a consuming inferno. These are the five pictures of God that Isaiah offers to his people. It's their choice to decide what God will be for them. One commentator concludes this passage with the following challenge. You can settle which of these two is to be your fate. To those who, by faith in that dear Lord who came to cast fire on the earth, have opened their hearts to the entrance of that searching, cleansing flame and who therefore therefore burn with kindred and answering fervors is a joy to know that their God is a consuming fire. For therein lies their hope of daily purifying and ultimate assimilation. To those, on the other hand, who have closed their hearts to the warmth of His redeeming love in Christ, what can the knowledge be but terror? What can contact with God in judgment be but destruction? The day cometh 
it burneth as a furnace, and all the proud and all, the wor all that work wickedness shall be as stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up. And so he asks, what will that day do for you? Well, thank you for being a part of our study of this part of the panorama of God's salvation history that we find in the book of Isaiah. Next week, we'll see how Isaiah's prophetic message in chapter 31 was fulfilled as we turn to chapter 37, where we'll see how God acted in response to Hezekiah's repentance. May God bless you as you feast on His Word today and throughout the week to come as you reflect on God's wisdom, His amazing forgiveness, and His unfailing love for you and those around you. I pray that those around you would turn to the Lord as well. In the meantime, keep calm and wash your hands. God bless you.